In a typical data set, we've got something like a spreadsheet. And in this spreadsheet, we've got columns, and our columns are our variables. And in this case, we've got five variables, and our rows contain our observations. Now, and we've got four observations here. What do I mean by observations? Let's talk about someone called James. James has got certain characteristics that we're interested in. He's a 27-year-old male. He weighs 75.1 kilograms. He's been categorized as short. And together, we call all of this information about James an observation. And we store that information as data under the appropriate column headings or variable headings. And of course, we can add as many observations as we want. And this is what makes up our data set. Now, the most common two types of data that we work with are categorical and numeric data. Let's take a look at a categorical variable like gender. Each person or each observation in our data set can be categorized either as male or female. And you can think of these categories as buckets into which the values from any other variable can be placed and then compared. So we could compare the average weight or the average age of men and women in this group, for example. Now let's take a look at a slightly different kind of categorical variable. In this case, I want to take a look at height, right? And this is what we call an ordinal categorical variable. Now in the case of height, again, we've got categories or buckets. And of course, again, we can categorize the observations in our data set. But in this case, the, the order matters, right? So it's short, medium, tall. That matters. And that's why we call it an ordinal categorical variable. There's a natural order to the categories. Now let's talk about the two types of numeric variables. These are numbers. They fall by definition on a number line, but they can fall on that number line in two different ways. They can be discrete or continuous, right? Let's talk about age. Age is typically given as a discrete variable. In other words, each observation falls definitively on a value on the integer number line, 32, 33, 34, etc. Weight, by contrast, falls on any number, including fractions between two integers, right? So in this example, Barra is 98.3 kilograms. But now we want to talk about how it is that we're going to describe all of these variables. A trick to understanding how your numeric variable values are distributed along the number line is to imagine them actually sitting on the number line where there is more than one observation for a particular number, they get stacked upon each other. And as you can see, this turns into an interesting shape, which we call a distribution. And this is an interesting idea that we use again and again and again in statistics. So here we've got a data set, and I've shown the distribution of the numeric variables by representing each observation as a ball. Let's take a look at the most useful ways that we can describe this data. Firstly, the minimum and the maximum values. And these also happen to be the parameters for the range. And the range tells us a little bit about the distribution or the spread of the data. And if we divide all of our observations into four equal groups, each of those groups will, of course, contain a quarter of all the observations. And we call the two middle quarters the interquartile range. And this, again, is telling us something about how the data is spread out. Now, the next three are interesting because they're trying to tell us something about the middle of the data. First of all, we've got the mean. The mean is the average. Then we've got the median, and the median is the value that splits all of the data into two equal groups. And then, of course, we've got the mode, which is the most common value. Now, where the distribution or the shape of this data is pretty symmetrical, as in this case, then those three values will be pretty much the same. However, if the distribution of values has got a long tail to the one side, right, the left side in this case, and we say this is left skewed, then suddenly the mean or the average is disproportionately affected by the outliers and these extreme values. And similarly, if you have a right skewed distribution, and remember, the tail is to the right, so we say that it's right skewed, the mean is way too far to the right, so it's not a good measure of centrality. Clearly, when the distribution is skewed, the median is a more robust measure of centrality. And finally, the standard deviation tells us about the average distance from the mean. In other words, how spread out the data is. So if this is the mean, then one standard deviation on either side of that is the average distance of the observations from the mean. And it turns out that if your data is normally distributed like this is, then about 68% of all of the observations will occur within one standard deviation on either side of the mean. And about 95% will be within two standard deviations. So what have we got? We've got the mean, the median, and the mode. They're telling us about centrality, about the middle. Where's the middle of this data? And then we've got the range, the interquartile range, and the standard deviation, and they're telling us about the spread and how spread out this data is. 
So I hope you liked this video. Absolutely make sure to check out the course this video was taken from and to register for a free trial account which will give you access to selected chapters of the course. If you want to learn how Met Mastery can help you become a great clinician, make sure to watch the About Met Mastery video. So thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.